Welcome friends, my name is Pastor James Rafferty and we are in lesson number three, The Lord Reigns. We are so excited about the study that we have been embarking on in the Psalms. First quarter of 2024, a great read. And there's no way we can cover all of the information here, but we are going to give you the opportunity to get some of our notes if you'd like to do a little bit of extra study in the Psalms. So you've got the quarterly that you can download, and then you can email us at SSP, that Sabbath School panel, SSP at 3A Beyond. 3abn.org. That's SSP at 3abn.org. And you get a copy of all of our notes. Now, some of those notes are going to be really tidy, really clean, and really full. And others are going to be just like, really? Well, how do you navigate all these notes? Those are going to be my notes, by the way, the ones that are really hard to navigate. But nevertheless, you get a copy of all the notes or any notes that you'd like that will go along with the Sabbath School. Uh, quarterly and give you more insights as you seek to study and learn together with us and maybe even as you seek to teach the class to others. Mm -hmm. All right, let me introduce the uh, my family, your family, our Sabbath School panel. To my immediate left is Daniel Perrin. Thank you. Happy to be here today for week three and I have Monday's lesson which is The Lord Reigns. Amen. Glad you're here, Daniel. And to your left is Jill Marconi. Thank you, Pastor James. I'm happy to be here too. On Tuesday, we look at God as the judge. Amen. Glad you're here, Jill. And to your left, Shelley Quinn. I am excited to get to do Ever Mindful of His Covenant. Amen. Glad you're here, Shelley. And to your left, Pastor John Dinsey. Yes, thank you for the blessing of being here. And I have Thursday. Your testimonies are very short. Amen. Amen. There's a lot for us to learn in the Psalms. And before we jump into this uh, lesson for this third week in 2024, first quarter. I've said that a few times, haven't I? We're going to start with a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask if Pastor John Dinsey, if you'd like to pray for us. Sure. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our loving mm. and blessed Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share from your Holy Scriptures the wonderful things we have discovered. And we pray that even now as we share, your Holy Spirit will give us words to speak that will be for life and for encouragement and for waking up an interest into continuing to study your Holy Scriptures. We mm -hmm. ask you for the blessing upon all. We ask it in the holy and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Seems like we've studied a lot so far. We were talking together about how the first week was very cerebral, a lot of good information laying a foundation for the Psalms. Then we talked about how the second week was a lot more emotional, a lot more uh, of a heart that we found there in the Psalms. And we were just talking about that and how that, that's the way the Psalms are. They've got a little bit of everything. And of course, those are just two aspects, but we are cerebral, we are emotional, and we need all of those elements to be part of our Christian or religious experience. So we're going to find more and more of this, these combinations in the Psalms. We're looking at this week's uh, study. We're looking at Psalm 8, Psalm 100, Psalm 97, Psalm 75, Psalm 105 verses 7 through 10, Galatians 3, 26 through 29, and Psalm 25 verse 10. I'm going to be focusing on Psalm 8 and comparing that with a New Testament version of Psalm 8, which is Hebrews chapter 2. Our memory text is found in Psalm 93 and verse 1. Here's what it says. The Lord reigns. He has robed the majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm and secure. And we see in this verse, this connection between the majesty of God and the fact that he's armed with strength and the world being established, uh, firm and secure. There's, there's a little bit of connection there between what is needed to make this world firm and secure and God's majesty and his strength and the fact that he's armed with majesty and strength. And that's really where we are right now in this world. And Psalm 8 along with Hebrews chapter 2, are going to explain that a little bit to us. The lesson quarterly says that the Psalms unswervingly uphold the foundational belief in God's sovereign reign. The Lord created and sustains everything that He had cre has created. He is the sovereign king over the whole world, and He rules the world with justice and righteousness, and His laws and statutes are good and bring life to those who keep them. The Lord is a just judge who ensures that the world remains well ordered. He does so by rewarding the righteous and punishing the wicked. But in his time, 
not ours. And I just want to emphasize, underline, circle, exclamation mark, <laughs> those last six words, but six words, but in his time and not ours. So in Psalm 8, 1 through 6, we see uh, the Lord as the creator of this world. Psalm 8, verses 1 through 6, O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the, thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast, hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. You've made him to have dominion over the works of thine hands, and you've put all things under his feet. And if only we could say that that is the present situation, that is the present case. But this is what God ordained. God ordained that we would have dominion over all the earth. God ordained that this earth would be created with the glory and the splendor of his image, his righteousness. There would be no pain and no suffering. And we know this because we see this in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And as we move all the way through the Bible, we see it again in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. We have this perfect earth with no pain, no sorrow, no death. And then we have again this perfect earth restored in Revelation 21. 21 and 22 with no pain, no sorrow, no crying, no death. But between those two is where we presently sit. And if you go to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 2, you find an explanation for what the psalmist depicts and where we find ourselves right now. In Hebrews chapter 2, Paul picks up with this same psalm, Psalm 8, but he adds a little something to it that we don't see in the original context of Psalm 8. Verse 6. But one in, in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? So there we have the same uh, verse being quoted again in the New Testament. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You set him over the works of thy hands. There we go. That's exactly what the psalmist says. Thou hast put all thing, things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection, verse 8 of Hebrews 2, under him. He left nothing that was not put under him. Okay, so there we go. Period. End of story. Not exactly. Notice the conjunction, the conjunction here, but, right? But, but now we see not yet all things put under him. Oh, what happened? But, verse 9 now we see another conjunction, but, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Now, as we compare Psalm 8 with Hebrews 2, we see that a change has taken place. A change has taken place in God's purposes and his will for planet Earth. Adam actually lost his dominion, the dominion that was given to him at creation. He and Eve chose to believe the lies of the prince of this world, of Lucifer the devil. And because of that, they were deceived. The whole world was deceived about God, about what kind of God created this world, about the character of God, the person of God, of, about what God is like. And we st st are still under the shadow of that deception to this day. So we have what we, the, the English grammar here calls a conjunction, and it's, it's a negative conjunction, but we do not now see all things under him, right? Um, but we do not now see all things under him is followed by another conjunction, another but, and this leads us to uh, a more positive uh, end because it's following, it's following this one with a focus on Jesus. It brings us this positive, but we see Jesus. We don't see everything under Adam and Eve, but we see Jesus, right? But we see Jesus. And you know, the devil rejoices that all things are not presently under the dominion of mankind in his original state. As God intended in the creation of this world, but the devil is not happy for that second conjunction. He doesn't like that second but. He doesn't like it because that brings Jesus in to restore yeah. this planet, right? To bring us back to our first dominion and restore everything in this planet. We're told in, in uh, Romans chapter 8 that the whole earth groans and travails in per birth, pain ready to be delivered. And that's what we see taking place in our present state. So when we look at our present situation, there's a battle taking place between these two conjunctions. 
nations, right? There's a battle taking place in our own individual personal lives. The New Testament brings us hope. We do not see all things under him, that is mankind due to sin and suffering, and cetera, but we see Jesus. Praise God Amen. for Jesus. The verse says that he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. That's you, that's me. If you're listening today, you are included in every man. If you are a woman, you are included in every man. If you are a young woman, you are included in every man. If you are a young man, you're included in every man. If you are an old man, you're included in every man. If you're an old woman, you're included in every man. If you're an infant man, an infant uh, woman, you're included in every man. Every person is included in every man. And that's the good news. Jesus Christ stepped in and he tasted death for every man. Psalm 75 says this, for promotion comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is judge. He puts down one, he sets up another. In the hand of the Lord there is a cup and the wine is red, it is full of mixture and he pours out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also sh I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous will be exalted. Jesus Christ became part of the human family and he drank this cup. He drank the dregs of this cup. He drank this cup that is to be wrung out to the wicked. He became sin for us, 2 Corinthians mm -hmm. chapter 5, verse 21 says. And therefore God remains sovereign by the le life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we look at this beautiful picture, we see recovery. We see that God has redeemed us. He's ransomed us through his son, Jesus Christ. And this is the good news. This is the picture that the Psalm, Psalms bring us. Many of the Psalms point to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They also point to the, victor the victory of Jesus Christ. Like for example, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein. Why? Because God is ransomed, because Jesus Christ had died for every single person. For he founded upon the seas, he established it upon the floods, he's the creator. Who will ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not, not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor so, sworn deceitfully. And then it goes on to say here, lift up your heads, O ye gates, lift them up, ye everlasting doors, for the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? the Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. God has redeemed us. God has established his covenant with us through Jesus Christ. And God has established that everlasting covenant through Jesus Christ for every single person on planet earth, every woman, every man, every child, every old person, every single person on planet earth is included in God's covenant of peace. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rafferty, for excellent lesson number one Sunday. I'm Daniel Perrin, and I have Monday's lesson, which is The Lord Reigns. Now, the title of this week's lesson is The Lord Reigns. The title of Monday's lesson is The Lord Reigns. And Monday's lesson focuses on Psalm 97, which starts with The Lord Reigns. Mm. So I'm just going to start this lesson off by saying, the Lord reigns. Mm. He's, he's in charge. Now, for a Christian, this kind of goes without saying, or at least it should. To reign, the definition is to possess or exercise power to rule. Now, there's really simple logic here that even a child can understand. So if there are any children listening out here, uh, I think you'll recognize this to be true. If I made it, then I'm in charge of it. Uh, I don't recommend trying this, but break something that a child made and they'll say, that's mine. Mm. I made it. This is one reason why the issue of creation is not a sideline issue that doesn't yes. matter. That's it right. matters who is in charge. Mm. So I want to take you now to several statements about the reign of the Lord. The lesson focuses especially on Psalm 97, but that is a piece of a seven 
block series of psalms from 93 to 99 that deals with the reign of the Lord as king. And it really is in response to the end of book three of the psalms. We're right at the beginning of book four. And book three ends with pleas for mercy and particularly Psalm 89 saying, how long, O Lord? And so book three takes us into the reign of God and the power of God. So especially when it appears as if God is not on the throne, maybe spend some time reading Psalm 93 to 99. This is not an apologetic that gives proofs for the reign of God, but it really is teaching us how to recognize and speak and act in faith. We have got to learn how to talk faith mm. and praise of God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're not really good at it because we don't identify the attributes of God. And so these Psalms here, 93 to 90, 99, I'm gonna take you one from each Psalm starting in Psalm 93. Psalm 93 verse two says this, your throne is established from old, you are from everlasting. Mm -hmm. So number one, the reign of God, the Lord's reign, the Lord reigns forever. Amen. Psalm 93 verse five, a little later there says, your testimonies are very sure, holiness adorns your house, O Lord, forever. Mm. Now, I really don't have any firsthand experience with the word forever. Mm. We say things like, that took forever. Mm. <laughs> we don't know what we're talking about mm. there. I live in a democracy where leaders come and go, elections, one power takes over from another power, administration changes, new philosophy emerges, and uh, things change. And so we uh, in our nations and governments really don't understand what it means for God to reign forever. He's not a reigning champion who's gonna be taken down by the next tournament leader. What does this mean for me? God is dependable. He's not going to change from day to day. I can trust God. It may sound trite, but oh, it is so very true. God is trustworthy. He's always there ahead of me. and He's been there behind me all along. Number two, Psalm 94, verse 12. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law. The Lord reigns fairly. Can you imagine a creator who does not control his creation? Mm. Absolutely. That's the God we serve, who gives us freedom mm -hmm. to accept or reject. And he teaches us, he gives us his law, which is fair, which he gives in detail, which he illustrates, which he, he refers back to and reminds us, which he presses upon our heart through the Holy Spirit, which he writes within us. The Lord reigns fairly. He gives, us, he gives us the truth. What does this mean for me? I don't need to live in stress or fear that, that God is gonna be unpredictable. Psalm 93, verses three to five. With the Lord, for the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. This is Psalm 95, three to five. Psalm 95, verse three, three to five. five. Okay. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. The Lord reigns with all authority. Mm. The sea is his, the land is his, mm. everything is his, above all gods, unless we're confused as to whether or not there are other gods. Psalm 96, the next chapter, verse five says, for all the gods of the people are idols, right. but the Lord made the heavens. Mm. When God determines a thing to be done, there is no one to overrule it. Mm. He has a plan of salvation that will not be derailed. There are things that may come up against God's plan, but it will not be derailed. Behind the scenes, God is working. Mm -hmm. What does this mean for me? I say that God reigns, but how much authority do I really give to God in my finances, in the, the way I spend my money, in the way that I think, in my relationships, in the cars that I drive, the groceries, my cell phone, every single thing mm -hmm. I lay at God's authority. Number four, we're moving to Psalm 96, verse six. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. The Lord reigns with majesty. And that, that uh, memory text for this week, the Lord reigns, he is clothed with majesty. Mm -hmm. Majesty, 
what a word. Nobody ever greets me like that. Mm. And there's a reason why. <laughs> because majesty is true greatness mm -hmm. and splendor and dignity mm -hmm. and commanding respect without having to utter a word. Beauty that takes your breath away, awe-inspiring, jaw-dropping. There's nothing about it that is out of place. And the Lord is robed with majesty. Mm. The Hebrew word here for majesty is geuth, which means rising up. And in some places of the Bible, it refers to people rising up in pride. But for, for the Lord, this rising up, this majesty is all his. A hush falls over everybody when his name is uttered. Mm -hmm. For me, what does this mean that the Lord reigns with majesty? It is pleasing, it is pleasant mm. to worship and serve God and more than pleasant, it is the pinnacle. It, it is the, the absolute purpose of all that I do. Mm. The next one, number five, Psalm 97. Verses two to six, and just a couple of phrases here in this, uh, in this section, in verses six to seven, the whole earth, the heavens, all the peoples, you'll find each of those there. The Lord reigns completely. Mm. The enemy claims to reign, and he certainly has influence over the minds and bodies of some, but the Lord reigns. And this is why Jesus said to the devil when he tried to tempt him, when he claimed territorial sovereignty, Jesus said in Matthew 4 to 10, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord and him only, only you shall serve because the Lord does reign over everything, even when it looks like he doesn't. For me, what does this mean? It means that I can thank God and I can praise him even before I see him act, because as a, a believer in God, I know that he reigns even when all, all the things that I see don't necessarily look like it in the moment. Mm -hmm. Number six, two more to go. Psalm 98, verses eight and nine. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together. This is nature getting excited about mm -hmm. God. Before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth with righteousness. He shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. Now we find this same thought in Psalm 94 verses 20 to 23 and in Psalm 96 verses 10 to 13. Now, God is fair in the giving of his law, and he's also fair in the administration of his law. Justice goes way beyond our, our human court ideals of truth. God judges based on truth. And what this means for me is that I can leave vengeance in the hands of God. Mm. I don't need to make anybody else pay. God's gonna take care of that. Mm. Psalm 99, verse eight. You answered them, O Lord our God, you were to them God who forgives, the Hebrew name there for God, El Nasa, though you took vengeance on their deeds. The Lord reigns with mercy. Hmm. He's a forgiving God. It is God's prerogative to forgive, and that is his demonstration and show of power that he forgives sin. And then for me, what that means is I too can be merciful to others. I like the way Proverbs 19, 11 says it. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger and his glory is to overlook a transgression. Mm. So if you're doubting whether or not God really is in charge for one reason or another, take these seven Psalms. You can read them through in, in 10 minutes and say, Lord, remind me of your attributes that you really are a God who reigns from top to bottom. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Amen. Thank you. We are studying lesson number three, The Lord Reigns. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back, friends. We are in Tuesday's lesson and we're going to pass it over to Jim Marconi. Thank you so much, Pastor James and Daniel. What a great study. What an incredible lesson. The Lord reigns. I'm Jill Morricone. And on Tuesday, we look at God is the judge. 
Specifically, we're going to study the investigative and the executive judgment from the book of Psalms. Now, you might be saying, but that's found in Daniel. And it most certainly is. That's found in Revelation. And it most certainly is. And to be honest with you, I haven't studied it as extensively in Psalms as I should have. So I'm excited about this lesson and we will learn together. First, we establish that God is our judge. I want to reread a scripture that Daniel just read. This is Psalm 98, verse 9. Psalm 98, 9. He is coming to judge the earth. God is is our judge. Mm. With righteousness, he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. He judges fairly. Mm -hmm. He judges righteously. So let's start with the investigative judgment and then we're going to switch gears and talk about the executive judgment. The investigative judgment, of course, we know that God investigates prior to passing judgment. Amen. We know that the judgment eventually will be against the wicked, but in favor of the righteous. Amen. We find it, of course, you find it in Daniel chapter 7, but we're going to find it in Psalms. This is not an exhaustive study, but let's look at a few principles we can glean from Psalms. Principle number one, looking down indicates investigation. We see this in Psalm 14 verse 2. Psalm 14, verse 2, the Lord, what are those words? Looks mm. down from heaven. When he's looking down, it indicates an investigation is about ready to take place. He looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there are any who understand, mm. who seek God. God is looking down. He is mm. investigating to see who seeks him or who follows him. Mm -hmm. Another principle we find is that God investigates from the heavenly sanctuary. Mm -hmm. We see this in Psalm 102, verse 19. Psalm 102, verse 19, it starts with the same phrase, for he looked down. Here again, we see this investigation about ready to take place. He looked down where? From the height of his sanctuary. The investigative judgment takes place with Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. From heaven, the Lord viewed the earth. The third principle we see is that God investigates prior to pronouncing judgment. In other words, the investigation takes place first, then the judgment takes place. For this, we look at Psalm 11. Psalm 11, verses 4 and 5. The Lord is in his holy temple. Where is he? He's in the temple, in the sanctuary. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. Mm -hmm. The Lord tests the righteous. Now, what's that word? Tests. Mm -hmm. In the Hebrew, it means investigate. Mm -hmm. The Lord investigates the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Mm -hmm. It's the same Hebrew word we find in Psalms 139, 23, and 24. Mm -hmm. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, that's the same word, investigate me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. It's the same word used in Jeremiah 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test, there's our word, mm -hmm. I investigate the mind, mm -hmm. even to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. Here again, mm -hmm. God investigates, he tests, or he investigates prior to passing judgment, Amen. prior to bringing according to their fruit. It's the same principle we see actually at the Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 11, remember God came down, there's our phrase again, when, come, when God comes down or looks down, he's investigating. Genesis 11, 5, the Lord came down to investigate, to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And before the legal verdict was uh, given, he investigated to see the work that the people were doing. Principle, principle number four, some judgment determines guilt. So first God investigates and then the judgment comes. And we'll see this in Psalm 53, verses two and three. God looks down here again, he's investigating from heaven on the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. In this case, the investigation determined our guilt. Mm -hmm. Wow. We're guilty before God, mm -hmm. but the judgment can also bring joy. 
I love this, Psalm 76, 8 and 9. You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to judgment, what happened? To deliver all the oppressed of the earth. In this case, God investigated. He, then he arose to judgment. And what happened? It was in favor of the saints. It was to deliver the oppressed. Now, let's look at the executive phase of the judgment. This is the final phase of the judgment. First is the investigation. Are God's people covered by his blood? Are they clothed in his righteousness? Have they confessed and forsaken every known sin? Or are they walking in outright open rebellion to him? We see in Revelation 20, of course, the description of the executive judgment or the great white throne judgment. This is the final destruction of the wicked, mm -hmm. the second death, as it were, that final annihilation. But let's look at it from Psalm 75, and we'll see this executive judgment take place. Psalm 75, we see a couple principles here. Principle one, the executive judgment is intense and it's destructive. Mm. Psalm 75, verse 8 the first portion of the verse. In the hand of the Lord, there is a cup, Pastor James references, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed and he pours it out. You know what it reminds me of? Mm. The third angel's message. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 14, mm -hmm. verse 10. He himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of the cup of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Mm -hmm. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, the presence of the Lamb. We see that the executive judgment is intense, but it's also destructive. Mm -hmm. Second principle we see, the executive judgment is for the wicked. If you keep reading in Psalm 75, you finish that verse. We already talked about in the Lord's hand is the cup, the wine is red, it's fully mixed, he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall who? all the wicked of the earth drain and drank down. Mm. The executive judgment, this final judgment is for the wicked. Mm. Third principle we see is that the executive judgment is final and irreversible. We're still in Psalm 75. Let's look at verse four. I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully. And to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Verse five, do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with a stiff neck. Jump down to verse 10. All the horns of the wicked, I will also cut off. Cutting off the horns of the wicked shows the end of their power. This is the end of their dominion. Mm -hmm. It's final, it's irreversible. We say the same principle in Psalm 97, verse three. And fire goes before him. Why? To burn up his enemies round about. It reminds me of Revelation chapter 20, where the wicked were judged, and what happened? They were cast into the lake of fire, mm -hmm. and it says in verse 14, this is the, the second, second death. <laughs> it's final, it's irreversible. Mm -hmm. The wicked do not have another chance. They're not coming back for another opportunity for repentance. It's final, they are extinguished, as it were, forever. Mm -hmm. The fourth principle we see is that the righteous are delivered from the wicked and they are sealed and safe. We're in Psalm 75 verse 10. We read the first part already. The horns of the wicked will be cut off. This is that final irreversible destruction of the wicked. But it doesn't stop there. It says the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. We see the same principle in Psalm 97 verse 10. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Mm. It reminds me again of Revelation 20, where the righteous are in the new Jerusalem. They are sealed, they are safe. This final executive judgment does not fall on them. The final principle we find here in Psalm 75 Principle number five is that there is an appointed time for judgment. Psalm 75, verse two. When I choose the proper time, in the NIV it says, when I choose the appointed time, I will judge uprightly. We see that all our times, our days, are in the hand of God. And he has an appointed time, not only for the investigative judgment, but for the final executive judgment. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing is you and I don't have to be afraid of the judgment because the judgment is in favor of God's people. Make a choice and follow him today. Amen. <laughs>
who knew that there was so much theology yeah. in the mm -hmm. in the oh, Psalms? I mean, it's no. beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Shelley Quinn. My lesson is Wednesday, Ever Mindful of His Covenant. And I, I would like to retitle, Ever Mindful of His Everlasting Covenant. You referenced several times Daniel 7.22, mm -hmm. where the Ancient of Days is seen and he's making a judgment in favor of the saints. So let's look at Psalm 94, because the theme of God's judgment is, is something that some people fear, but it ought to give, if you're yeah. a person of God, if you're in covenant relationship with the Lord, it should bring you peace and assurance of salvation. Let's look at Psalm 94. We'll begin with verse eight. Um, well, actually, 8 through 15, it's just God's judgments are given to the people to uh, turn the people to righteousness and to demonstrate that God cares for them. But now look at verse 12. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law that you may give him rest from the days of adversity. Who wants rest from the days mm. of adversity? Oh, yeah. Until the pit is dug for the wicked. Mm. For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. Mm. But judgment will return to righteousness. That's the purpose of God's judgment is to restore righteousness and all the upright in heart will follow it. Okay, turn to Psalm 105. As a whole, this Psalm shows the Lord's faithfulness to his covenant in Israel's history. But we see that no matter what happened, the good and the bad, God was there. So Psalm 105 verse 7 through 10. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in the earth. Verse 8. He remembers his covenant forever. What covenant? Mm. This isn't the covenant at Mount Sinai with all the civil and, and social and ceremonial laws. This is the everlasting covenant and it's proven in context. Let's look. Mm. He remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham mm -hmm. and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant. Mm -hmm. God's people are his treasured inheritance and he established his everlasting covenant of righteousness by faith. Grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Revelation 13, 8, he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 13, 20, Christ's blood is the blood of the mm -hmm. everlasting covenant and the goal of righteousness by faith, the goal of the everlasting covenant of God is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, mm -hmm. that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So what Psalm 105 is pointing to is this covenant God remembers forever, is the covenant he announced in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, 15, when he talked about the seed that was coming, that would be the deliverer. In, in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God yeah. and it was credited or imputed to him as righteousness. And we see that he ratified this covenant of salvation by grace and righteousness by faith in Genesis 15 when he put Abraham in a deep sleep. Mm -hmm. But then I've got to point this out. He renewed the covenant, the everlasting covenant, with Abraham's son, Isaac. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Listen to this. Genesis 26, 4 through 5. God says to Isaac, I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heaven. 
I will give to your descendants all these lands and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Mm -hmm. Boy, that is verbatim what he said to Abraham. So he's renewing the covenant here. But look at verse 5. God says, I'm going to renew this covenant with you because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Mm -hmm. God has always, from the very beginning, God had the moral code of love, the Ten Commandments, and if you follow it through, you can find them all in Genesis. But then he renews this. Abraham was obedient, mm -hmm. and that's why God chose him. Actually, he knew he would teach his children. So then he renews it with Jacob as well. You know, one of my favorite verses is Isaiah 42, verse 6. Mm. God is speaking. This is one of the servant songs. It's a prophecy about the Messiah. Mm. And God is speaking in prophetic words to the Messiah. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will keep, keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, bring out prisoners from the prison, and those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is the seed of, mm. of Abraham. That's what we find in Galatians 3.16. He is the one who ratified the new covenant with his blood. And I wish we had time for this. We don't have time for it all. But Galatians 3, 6 through 9, Paul says, just as Abraham believed God, he, it was accounted to him mm -hmm. for, as righteousness. Those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Mm -hmm. We get the same promise. Mm -hmm. And it's so precious that Paul says in verse 20, let's look at Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God. That is a covenant term. Sons of God. Whether you're a man or a woman, this, re this is neuter gender, if you will. You're sons of God through faith in Christ. You're a child of God. John 1, 12 says, as many as received him, to them he gave the mm -hmm. right to become a That's child right. of God. So through your faith in Christ Jesus, for as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor uh, free. There's no male, no female. All are one in Christ Jesus. If you are Christ, you are Abraham's mm. seed and heirs according to the promise. Mm -hmm. Why am I bringing this in? God's got this everlasting covenant. We see it in the Psalms and God is forever faithful to his covenant. Did you know these people who wrote these Psalms by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, if you're in Christ, they're your heirs. They are not your, they're your ancestors. Ancestors, thank you. Mm -hmm. So here's what the ancestors believed. They believed that God actively works to secure his people in them. Listen, Psalm 103. Two through five. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, mm -hmm. who forgives all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns your loving kind you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Psalm twenty nine eleven, the Lord gives strength to his people. Mm -hmm. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Yes. Amen. Psalm 25, 8 through 10. This is, oh, look this one up. Psalm 25, 8 through 10. This is so important for us to see because it is repeated throughout the Old and the New Testament. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. The humble, those who depend upon him, he guides in justice. And the humble, he teaches his way. Those who will yield to him. Mm -hmm. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Mm -hmm. To whom? To such as keep his covenant. Mm -hmm. 
and his testimonies. First mm. John chapter 3, 7 through 8. John says, don't let anyone deceive you. Mm-hmm. Only he who practices righteousness is righteous. Psalm 85, 13 says righteousness. It goes before the Messiah and is his pathway to follow. God is faithful to his everlasting covenant if we will be faithful to him. Amen. 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 What a blessing it has been to listen to each and every one of you. But we are not done. We still have Thursday. And my name is John Dinsey. The title for Thursday is Your Testimonies Are Very Sure. And we're going to take a look at Psalm 19, 7, Psalm 93, 5, Psalm 119, 165, mm-hmm. Psalm 1, 2, and 6, Psalm 18, 30, and uh, a few others. <laughs> so hang in there. <laughs> uh, let's go first to Psalm 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I would love to pause there and tell you more about that. But uh, let's go to Psalm 93, verse 5. Your testimonies are very sure. Mm -hmm. Holiness adorns your house, O Lord, forever. Mm -hmm. Psalm 1, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So see, we're looking here at the testimonies of the Lord and the law of the Lord. Uh, Psalm 1, verse 6 says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So the righteous keep God's law, but the wicked will perish because they do not keep God's law. Notice Psalms 25, verse 10, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep His covenant and His testimonies. Psalm 119, 165, another wonderful scripture. Great peace have they who love your law and nothing shall cause them to stumble. Mm -hmm. These scriptures are uh, worthy of your meditation. The lesson brings this out, and I'd like to read to you. The Lord's supremacy in the world as the sovereign creator, king, and judge has theological implications for the reliability of, of his testimonies. The testimonies, uh, Hebrew edut, decree or law, refer to the body of laws and ordinances with which the Lord governs the religious and social life of his people. You can see Exodus 32, 15. And I'm going to read Exodus 32, 15 and 16. It says, And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hands. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other were they written. Now, who wrote them? And the tables were the work of God. Mm. And the writing was the writing of God, Mm. graven upon the tables. This, of course, shows permanence. Mm -hmm. Written on uh, stones, uh, stone, uh, not... uh, Paper, not papyrus or papyrus, Mm -hmm. however you say it. Uh, It was indication of permanence. Now, we read several verses like Psalm 93, 5. that says that that they are very sure. And this, according to the lessons, reflecting the stability and permanence of God's throne and the world that God created and sustains, as uh, you can see in Psalm 93, verse 1 and 2. The Hebrew word translated as sure... Uh, conveys the notion of reliability, faithfulness, and firmness. God's laws are unchangeable and indestructible. Why? Because God's law is perfect. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting. I have uh, access to a dictionary that shows ancient Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And it shows something very interesting, a pictograph showing a seed going down to the ground, but showing also water reflection of uh, that it could be water or blood and seed that shows continuance and a seed, of course, bears fruit. In a Hebrew dictionary, uh, as we said, confirms faithfulness, uh, confirms uh, stability and permanence. 
And so I go back to Psalm 119, 152. Concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them forever. God's law is forever. It's unchangeable. It's written in stone, written by God's own finger. Of all the things in the Holy Scriptures, he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. This is important and worthy of your consideration. Psalm 18, let's go to verse 3. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. So here the lesson is focusing in that God shows righteousness and shows uh, uh, justice. But in the world that does not obey God's law, we have ungodliness, we have wickedness. And David says that they are like a flood. And because of the wickedness in the world, he's afraid. <laughs> Even today, we look in society and we hear uh, horrible uh, stories of crime. Uh, sometimes, you know, I used to live in Chicago and sometimes I hear they killed uh, 50 people or more in just one weekend. Wow. Gunfire, gun violence and all kinds of violence. This is a terrible world we live in. Notice uh, Psalm 18, verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. This is the background to Psalm 18, 7. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. God is angry with the evildoers. Mm -hmm. And the time is coming when he will take vengeance. Every evil act, every evil word, he will take vengeance and the wicked will have to repay. So you may look at yourself and say, well, I'm wicked. I'm a sinner. The Lord offers forgiveness for all those who come come to him mm -hmm. and he who comes to him he will not cast out mm -hmm. he is extending his hands in mercy offering you salvation through jesus christ psalm 94 verse 1 2 and 3 O lord god to whom vengeance belongs O god to whom vengeance belongs shine forth mm -hmm. notice rise up O judge of the earth render punishment to the proud Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? This is uh, David pouring out his heart. How long are the wicked going to continue to do wickedness? Mm. When, O oh Lord, are you coming to take vengeance? Uh, Romans 12, it, it was brought out. We're repeating it again. Uh, verse 19 and 20. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And the Lord knows when to take vengeance and when to repay. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. So we are invited to uh, love our enemies and feed our, the, uh, the hungry that are our enemy. But going back to God's law, we read again, Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Yes, friends, keeping God's commandment, there is great reward. But of course, we have to remember that in Romans 3.20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But Jesus also shows us that it is important to keep the commandments. Mm -hmm. We'll try to get to that as soon as we can. Uh, Romans 3.31, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Romans 7.10, And the commandment which was to bring life, I find... I found to bring death. Well, why does the commandment bring death and it was supposed to be for life? Because Paul has sinned. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, 
but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I have one more scripture I want to share with you. That's uh, Psalm 119, 105. Notice, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's God's word. You know, the Ten Commandments are also God's word. They are a lamp unto your feet and a light to your path. And the Lord Jesus Christ is asking us to keep them. I go back to Psalm 119, 165, with which we began. Great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. Mm -hmm. So we encourage you to keep God's law because you love the Lord with all of your heart. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Thanks be to the Lord for that. Amen. 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 We've got just a few minutes for some closing thoughts. We'll start with Daniel. I'd like to leave you with some words that you've already heard, but we need to hear them again. The Lord reigns. And that's a statement about God, but it's an invitation to you to do what Psalm 95, 6 and 7 says. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the sheep of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. Amen. Amen. As we look at our God reigns, I'm reminded of the investigative and the executive judgment. And when we study that, we discover that our God is over all, that our God is sovereign, that our God sees and knows everything, and that our God loved you and I so much that he gave Jesus so that we had opportunity to have judgment in our favor and spend an eternity with him. Amen. Amen. When I think about God's everlasting covenant, do you realize that from, from the garden, from before the garden, God's mm -hmm. pathway to salvation, to restoration of righteousness has always been the righteousness by faith from the Messiah. Those people were in the ancients, they were saved looking forward to Christ, were saved looking back, mm -hmm. but only to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies will you find those paths of mercy and truth. Amen. A perfect God of love gave us a perfect law because He loves us and is for our benefit. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Give this deep thought. Amen, amen. Some great stuff there. God is our creator. He investigates, he executes because he has given us the everlasting covenant in Jesus Christ and his law is permanent. It's the standard. And so God wants us to keep what he's given us. He wants us to keep that covenant that he's given us in Jesus Christ because the Lord reigns. Well, that was a great lesson for this week. We're going to be looking forward to our next lesson, week number four, which is the Lord hears and the Lord delivers. We're continuing to study the book of Psalms and we look forward to our next study together. Until then, God bless. Mm -hmm.